Virtuous Anti-Semitism, published in 1969 by Jean Emery. When de Gaulle was toppled, quite a few people felt as gloomy as Heine's two gran grenadiers did when they heard of Napoleon's detention, and so, indeed, did I. Yet in New York, alas, the French UN delegate, Armand Berard, had nothing better to do, according to the Nouvelle Observateur of March 5th, than to cry out despairingly, Cesse le juif. It's the Jewish gold. And no disclaimer followed. On the political right, on the political left, everything is reversed. Anti-Semitism has this ability, and as Stephen George once put it, quote, it sweeps into the ring, end quote. Footnote. This is a reference to the final line of the poem beginning with the line in Richard F. C. Hull's translation, quote, call it the bolt that struck the sign that led, end quote, in Stefan George's Star of the Covenant, published in 1914. The line actually reads, quote, a guide toward dance I sweep into the ring, end quote. The first-person narrative is the God who forcefully facilitates the creation of the exclusive spiritual realm envisaged by George. Amari evidently felt that this imagery was well-suited to reflect the ability of anti-Semitism to unite otherwise disparate, indeed mutually attenuating or contradictory forces. For Hull's translation of the poem, <coughs> see George Peter Landman. Oh, blah, blah, blah. Um, classical anti and a footnote. Classical anti-Semitism is taking on a contemporaneous guide. <laughs> Yet its previous guide lives on. A rare case of genuine coexistence. The past stays with us and will continue to stay with us in the form of the crooked nose and bow-legged Jew, forced to flee by one circumstance or another, or rather by them all. This is also how you will see him on Arab propaganda placards and pamphlet covers, which I gather formerly brown gentlemen, whose first language is German, helped produce, now hidden carefully behind Arabic names. The relevant new notions reared their heads in the immediate aftermath of the Six-Day War and are gradually gaining ground. They hinge on the Israeli oppressor trampling peaceable Palestinian land underfoot with the iron tread of Roman legions. Today's anti-Israelism and anti-Zionism and the anti-Semitism of yesteryear find themselves in absolute agreement. Apparently one can seamlessly merge the notion of the Jew as the, as the oppressive legionary with the iron tread with that of the Jew as the runaway with the bowed legs, how the images finally resemble each other. What certainly is new, however, is that the form that this form of anti-Semitism, now dressed up as anti-Israelism, is located firmly on the left. Whereas in the past it was considered the socialism of fools, it is now evolving into an integrative constituent of socialism per se and the socialists of their own free volition are universally turning themselves into fools. For an instructive account of this development, one can turn to Givet's La Gauche Contre Israel, um, how does, how does that? published by Pauvert more than a year ago. Footnote. Jacques Givet, The Left Against Israel? Question mark, essay on the New Anti-Semitism.
or one might simply take note of certain landmark occurrences. End foot, excuse me, end foot note. Or one might take simply take note of certain landmark occurrences. One might read the report, quote, the third front, end quote, in the journal Concrete, for example. One of its sections headings reads, quote, is Israel a police state? End quote. The question is purely rhetorical. Needless to say, Israel is just that. Not to mention napalm, the blowing up of the houses of peaceable Arab peasants, and the pogroms against Arabs in the streets of Jerusalem. One knows one's stuff. The situation there is just like the one in Vietnam or previously in Algeria. In his new role as the terror-spreading Goliath, the bow-legged runaway is apparently an absolute natural. I do mean THE left, and by no means merely the still more or less orthodox communist parties in the West, or the policies of the quote, really existing, end quote, socialist states. For the latter, anti-Israelism, grafted on the traditional anti-Semitism of the Slav peoples, is simply part and parcel of their strategic and tactical response to a specific constellation. The stars do not lie, and the Gamolkas of this world know what they can expect. Footnote. As head of the Polish Communist Party and de facto head of state, Vladislav Gomolka, 1905-1982, oversaw the massive wave of repression against the country's Jews following the Six-Day War, which led to a massive exodus of Polish Jews. End footnote. Ces de bon guerre. Translation, all's fair in love and war. What more is there to say? Far more disconcerting is the fact that the intellectual left affiliated with no political party has appropriated this imagery. For years, to take the German case, one celebrated the armed Israelis, and not least the stylish girls in uniform, tilling the Israeli soil. Obvious feelings of guilt were thus discharged in a tainted currency, which was always going to become tiresome. Fortunately for once, the Jew, instead of being burned, has now emerged in the imperious, as the imperious victor and occupying power, which brings us back to napalm and all of that. Footnote. This is presumably a reference to Gotthold Ephraim Lessing's Nathan the Wise, published in 1779. In Act 4, Scene 2, the Patriarch three times dismisses mitigating circumstances presented by the Templar with the words, quote, it matters not, the Jew must still be burned, end quote. End footnote. The country breathed a sigh of relief. Everyone now felt able to express themselves in the manner of the Deutsche Nationale und Soldaten, excuse me, Soldaten Zeitung. Even those on the left were empowered to enforce their jargon of commitment as though its validity were self-evident. Footnote. The Deutsche National und Soldaten Zeitung is a far-right German weekly established in 1951. End footnote. This much is for sure. Anti-Semitism resides in anti-Israelism and anti-Zionism as the thunderstorm does in the cloud, and it has become respectable again. In its vulgar guise, it can freely speak of the, quote, criminal state of Israel, end quote. In its more genteel guise, it is at liberty to describe Israel as the, quote, bridgehead of imperialism, end quote while lamenting in passing the ill-conceived sense of solidarity 
that lies more or less that ties more or less all Jews, a few laudable exceptions apart, to the tiny state and expressing outrage at the fact that the Parisian Baron Rothschild thinks French Jewry should pay a levy to support Israel. Invariably, anti-Semitism has an easy ride. The emotional infrastructure is in place, and by no means just in Poland or Hungary. The anti-Semite enjoys, quote, demythologizing, end quote, the Jewish pioneer state. It strikes him that capitalism in the form of the Jewish plutocracy was behind the creation of this state from the outset. Not that he would explicitly mention this plutocracy. To do so would amount to lapsus linguae, or linguae, footnote, a slip of the tongue. Even so, so Even so, it's the Jews' gold. Ces le juif. Surely nobody can in any doubt can be in any doubt about the actual character of a country born of a bad idea and established in a bad place, which has fought and won more than one bad war. To avoid unnecessary misunderstandings, I know as well as the next man that Israel does indeed find itself in the disagreeable role of being an occupying power. I would not dream of countenancing everything that various Israeli governments do. My relation to this country, described by Thomas Mann in his Joseph Tetralogy as, quote, a Mediterranean land, not exactly like home, a bit dusty and stony, end quote, are virtually non-existent. Footnote. Thomas Mann, Joseph and His Brothers. Joseph and His Brothers is a four-part novel, four novel based on the biblical account of Joseph's life. End footnote. I have never been to Israel. I do not speak its language. How little I know of its culture borders on the embarrassing, and its religion is not mine. And yet the existence of no other state means more to me. At this point, all descriptive or analytically ob analytical objectivity ends, and commitment ceases to be mere, merely some obligation entered into voluntarily, and becomes, in various senses of the word, existential in nature. Israel, the now fashionable anti-Israelism, the old-fashioned anti-Semitism that invariably creeps into every such new fashion, these are issues that for anyone who is in some way, quote, affected, end quote, by them, i.e. Jews and persons classified as Jews by the Reich's citizenship law of September 15, 1935, are of existential subjective significance, and that may well, for this very reason, attain a degree of objectivity bordering on that of natural law. After all, even if, according to some perverted pseudo-Marxist theology, Israel may be beholden a hundred times over to the sinfulness of advanced technological development, even by the most straightforward, never mind more sophisticated standards, there can be no doubt that this pioneer country is the most endangered of all the states in its geopolitical region. Israel wins victory on victory, and yet catastrophe continues to loom, and that catastrophe certainly cannot be avoided by walking straight into it, i.e. by seeing Israel incorporate into some Palestinian federation. The day will come when the Arab states, whom I wish peace and good fortune, will catch up with Israel's developmental advantage, and demographic pressures will do the rest. Even then, until peace and progress in the economic and technological spheres have changed the Arabs' minds and allow them to recognize Israel with insecure borders, Israel must, under all circumstances, be preserved. This is the actual issue. For whom? Here the subjective state of mind striving towards historical objectivity comes into its own. 
for Jews, Jews and persons classified as, and so on, for every single one of them, wherever they may live, Israel's continued existence is indispensable. Quote, Am I going to be forced to call out, quote, Long live Johnson, end quote, if the United States is the only country to stand against the annihilation of Israel? I am prepared to do so, end quote. Claude Landsman, left-wing radical writer and one of Sartre's students, exclaimed on the eve of the Six-Day War. There you have somebody who knew what was at stake and what was required, for each and every Jew, whether he grasps this or not, is abandoned to a catas catastrophic fate. He is a, quote, catastrophe Jew, end quote. The Black Panther's graffiti, quote, run pale Jew, end quote, on the shops and residences of Jewish tradesmen in Harlem, flippantly oblivious to the long-standing bond that chained the Jew to the Negro in the United States, a bond no bourgeois Jewish tradesman, no matter how sleazy, would ever have betrayed. Who can guarantee that a future U.S. administration will not one day feed the Jew to the Negro in a celebration of a grand day of atonement? Who can assure the influential and in some cases wealthy Jews of France that the heirs of the Drumont Morat and Xavier Valla will not one day become a virulent force again? Footnote. Edward Drumont, 19, excuse me, 1844 to 1917, was one of the pioneers of modern political anti-Semitism. He was best known for his groundbreaking anti-Semitic treatise, La France Juive, Ju I don't know, 1880, published in 1886. Charles Murat, 1868 to 1952, who came to prominence as a vocal anti dreyfusard founded the far-right Action Française, and later supported the Vichy regime. After the war, Marat received a life sentence, but was re released on medical grounds shortly before his death. Xavier, or Xavier, Vala, 1891-1972, was profoundly shaped by the ideas of Drummond and Morat, and served in a number of positions within the Vichy regime, notably in 1941 to 42, as first director of the General Commissariat for Jewish Affairs. In this capacity, he laid some of the decisive groundwork for the implementation of the Shoah in France. Sentenced to ten years in prison after the war, he was released early and rejoined the far-right movement as a journalist and activist. End footnote. Who can vouch for the fact that Franz Josef Strauss, once in power, would not dream up something suited to make even a certain newspaper tycoon think twice about making further sordid donations to an Israeli government sordidly willing to accept them? Footnote. Franz Josef Strauss, 1915 to 1988, was a larger-than-life, staunchly conservative Bavarian politician, firmly and emphatically on the right wing of the Christian democratic movement in West Germany. Strauss first joined the federal cabinet in 1953, serving as defense minister from 1956 to 1962, and as financial minister from 1966 to 1969. During his time in the defense industry, his heavy-handed persecution of West Germany's foremost weekly, Der Spiegel, caused a major scandal and earned him considerable notoriety. The, quote, newspaper tycoon, end quote, in question is Axel Kessar Springer, 1912-1985. 
alongside serious papers like Die Welt and Middlebrow papers like the Berliner Morgenpost and the Hamburger Abendblatt, he owned a number of extremely successful tabloids, Bild, BZ. Especially in 1968, his enterprise became the object of violent protest because many of the protesting students and activists held this paper responsible for creating the hostile environment that inter alia had facilitated the attempt on the life of the prominent activist Rudy Dutschka. In 1972, the Red Army faction carried out a bomb attack on his publishing firm's headquarters in Hamburg. Axel Springer was a staunch supporter of Israel. End footnote. Nobody guarantees nothing. This is no paranoid fantasy, nor just a matter of the dangers invariably inherent in the human condition. The past, the most recent past, continues to burn. Now all my leftist friends will tell me that I am joining the battalions exploiting the six, or let it be five or four million murdered Jews, the just five or four million murdered Jews, to blackmail public opinion. This is a risk worth taking. It is a smaller risk than the one my friends would have us take when they plead for the self-disbandment of the, quote, Zionist, end quote, state of Israel. Practical political reason dictates that Israel, indeed, that Israel in particular, deserves the solidarity of any left that is not intent on abrogating itself. And there is no reason why it should need to ignore the unbearable fate of the Arab refugees in order to honor this commitment. To be sure, it is a commitment less binding for the non-Jewish leftist than it is for the Jew than it is for Jews of any political stripe, or none, because one can resign from the left, whereas a pioneering anti-Semite like Lanz Liebenfels already knew nobody can leave their Jewishness behind. Even so, the left is predicated on an unwritten moral code, which it may not comprise. Quote, excuse me, which it may not compromise. Quote, where there is a stronger party, always take the side, always side with the weak, excuse me. Quote, where there is a stronger party, always side with the weaker one, end quote. How inviolable is the truth of this commonplace? And the stronger party, who could possibly claim otherwise, are the Arabs. They are stronger in number, stronger in oil, stronger in dollars. One need only ask Aramco or Kuwait, and they definitely have the stronger prospects. Yet clearly the left is spellbound by the brave Palestinian partisans, who are indeed poorer than Moshe Dayan's men. Footnote. Moshe Dayan, 1915-1981, was one of Israel's leading military commanders, but also served as a deputy of the Knesset and minister in various governments. He was highly praised for his role in the wars of 1956 and 1967, but many later blamed him for Israel's lack of preparedness in 1973. Instantly recognizable, not least due to his eye patch, he had lost an eye fighting against Vichy France in Syria during the Second World War. For many in the West, he embodied the Israeli military. End footnote. It fails to recognize that the Rothschild Rothschilds and the prosperous American... Excuse me. It fails to recognize... Geez, I guess I should say, did I say end footnote? Well, the footnote's over. <laughs> it fails to recognize that the Rothschilds and the prosperous Jewish-American middle class notwithstanding, the Jew is still worse off than Franz Fanon's colonized individual. It is as oblivious to this fact as it is to the anti-imperialist liber anti liberation struggle fought by the Jews against the British in Mandate Palestine.
nor, for that matter, are the Israelis responsible for the fact that the Soviet Union soon forgot right, why, forgot what Gromyko had recited with beautiful vibrato before the UN in 1948. Quote, As regards the Jewish state, its existence is already a fact. Whether or not anyone likes that state, it is actually there. The USSR delegation cannot but express surprise at the position adopted by the Arab states in the Palestine question, and particularly at the fact those states, or some of them at least, have resorted to such action as sending their troops into Palestine and carrying out military operations aimed at the suppression of the national liberation movement in Palestine. We cannot identify the vital interests of the peoples of the Arab East with the statements of certain Arab leaders or with those actions of the governments of certain Arab states which we are witnessing at present." End quote. Um, this is just a side note. Um, it's generally not really quite discussed too often that uh, the Soviet Union was a major player in the foundation of Israel, and without its support, uh, Israel probably would not have been founded. Um, the other thing is that there's this idea that the CIA and like the State Department and all these pr people were uh, pro-foundation of Israel, but that was not the case. Uh, I believe that Harry Truman, uh, who believed in the founding of the State of Israel, had to really fight a back against other people within the government uh, to support this. Uh, the people in the State Department and the various forces of the military, which I'm not an expert on, very much associated the foundation of a Jewish state with the foundation of a communist sympathetic state that would be... Uh, bad for American foreign policy in the Middle East. So the idea that the Soviet, the Soviet Union switched its course and made it sound like a, the founding of Israel was just, you know, an imperialist plot by the USA, but they were, uh, the USSR was fundamental, the, uh, fundamentally crucial in um, the, creation, the cre creation of Israel out of the British mandate. I'm not an expert on the entire history of it. I'm probably more of a novice than who's ever li whoever's listening to this. But uh, that's my understanding of the history. Anyway. End of that quote. Um, let me see, there's a footnote here. Yeah, that quote was from the UN Security Council 299th meeting, May 21st, 1948. As I say, this was the position of the Soviet Union, a superpower engaged in superpower politics. In the long run, the Soviets were presumably unable to ignore the fact that there are more Arabs than Jews, that there is more Arab than Israeli soil, that military bases in Arab states have greater strategic value than a foothold in Israel. The left in the wider and widest sense, however, and especially the protesting radical left with whom, in many respects, I feel connected cannot take recourse to this superpower excuse. If it heeds the law presiding at its birth, the left is obligated to understand, to grasp the tragic weakness of the Jewish state and of every individual Jew in the diaspora, to understand what lies behind the facade of the bourgeois Jewish middle class, behind the myth of the money-lending and fabulously wealthy Jew, from Yud Sus to the current Rothschilds and a handful of Jewish Hollywood moguls. Footnote. Yosef Sus... Excuse me. I, sp I pronounced his name wrong. Yud Zus. Or Zeus. Yud Zeus, I suppose it says. Okay, back to the footnote. Yosef Zeus Oppenheimer 
1698 to 1738, called, quote, Yud Zeus, by his detractors, was a tax collector and leading financier at the court of the Principality of Württemberg, who antagonized the nobility by modernizing the territory's tax system to the advantage of the ducal exchequer. Oppenheimer was arrested within hours of the death of his patron, Duke Karl Alexander. Following a show trial, Oppenheimer was executed by strangulation and his corpse put on public display for six weeks. Oppenheimer has frequently been seen as the paradigmatic, quote, court Jew, end quote, and features in numerous literary works, including Leon Feuchtwanger's novel Jud Zeus, 1925, which in turn was cannibalized by Veit Harlan for the script of the infamous Nazi propaganda film of the same name, 1940. Yeah, so Jud Zeus is a uh, very, very, very famous Nazi propaganda anti-Semitic Nazi propaganda film. Um, yeah, this is me talking now, not the thing. And uh, I think it's viewed as probably the most extreme. And may maybe it's not the most extreme, but it's like the most well-known, most extreme uh, film from the Nazi propaganda era. Um, I think it was available on YouTube for a long time, but that was back when YouTube was more Wild West-esque, <laughs> less uh, regulated. Now if you want to put something fucking hateful on YouTube, you just have to pay a uh, price of advertising. Anyway. So much for Yudzus. Yudzus. Jews handle capital with some regularity, but they have never controlled capital. To this day, Jews no more call the shots on Wall Street than Jews were in charge of the heavy industry in, P in Imperial Germany. Israel's, Israel is no more a bulwark of capitalism now than it was when the first pioneers began to dig, their, dig the soil there. Nor can the Arab states reasonably be considered progressive. The left, alas, closes its eyes. As coincidence would have it, I recently stumbled across a text by Hans Blucher, in which he writes, maybe it's Hans Bluer. I think H's are silent. Okay, let's just say Hans Bluer. H-A-N-S-B-L-U with the dots. <laughs> H-E-R. In which he writes, quote, A genuine history of Europe should be written not as it has in the past, the Jew featuring here and there anecdotally. Rather, the account should render the consistent might of Jewry as a clandestine, constantly active, imperious power visible. End quote. Footnote. As a young man, the cultural historian and sexual theorist Hans Bluer was a theoretician and practitioner of what he considered the homoerotic essence of the so-called youth movement that enthusiastically embraced a romanticizing vitalist love of nature in opposition to the ostensible decadence of urban civilization and industrial society. Following his conversion to heterosexuality and marriage, he became an increasingly outspoken, folkish anti-Semite. End footnote. One might just as well find this text verbatim in one of the numerous pseudo-intellectual Arab publications currently flooding the press. Like Bluer, or since anti-Semitism, excuse me, likewise Bluer, or since anti-Semitism invariably levels intellectual distinctions, Streicher, Streicher, for that matter, could be the author of the remarks of the education minister of the progressive state of Syria, recently 
the progressive state of Syria recently addressed to the director general of UNESCO. Quote, The hatred which we indoctrinate into the minds of our children from their birth is sacred. End quote. Footnote. The letter from Suleiman al Kash to Rene Mahu was publicized in the Baathist paper Al Thalra on May 3rd, 1968. All this would barely merit attention, and Bluer, in all his craziness, could enjoy the restful peace of oblivion had the intellectual left in Western Europe not appropriated this lexicon and accepted the, nor the norms it conveys. It would seem that a new notion of Jewish guilt is being constructed from the historical calamity of the, quote, Jewish question, end quote. In reality, the anti-Semites question, a calamity of which the establishment of the now real existing state of Israel may well be a part. The responsibility for this development lies squarely with a left that has lost its sense of self. As Robert Mizrahi, a French philosopher who, like the aforementioned Claude Landsman, belongs to Sartre's extended family, recently stated, quote, Anti-Zionism is a fundamentally reactionary phenomenon camouflaged by its revolutionary and anti-colonial rhetoric about Israel, end quote. The time has come for a revision and renewed intellectual self-renunciation on the left, for it is the left that is providing anti-Semitism with a nefarious dialectical veneer of virtuousness. The alliance between the anti-Semitic Philistines' coven and the leftist on the barricades is to use the language imposed by this issue contrary to nature. It is a sin against the spirit. Footnote. The expression, quote, Philistine's coven, end quote, is used here for, quote, Spieser Stammtisch, end quote. A Stammtisch is a table in a pub reserved for a specific round of regular guests. The term can be used in a neutral descriptive sense, but also has rather more sinister and exclusionary connotations. The online version of the Duden, which records the current standard use of German, defines Stammtischpolitik, i.e. Stammtischpolitics, as, quote, Naive political discussion, talking politics at the Stammish, is an unqualified, in an unqualified, unobjective manner. End quote. End footnote. The likes of the Polish general Mokzar may be able to get away with the transmutation of crude anti-Semitism into contemporaneous anti-Israelism. Footnote. As Poland's Minister of the Interior from 1964 to 1968, General Mieczysław Mazar, 1913 to 1986, was one of the leaders of the anti-Semitic campaign following the Six-Day War. Mazar was also responsible for the crushing of the student protests in the late 1960s. End footnote. The left has to be more truthful. There is no such thing as a virtuous anti-Semitism. How did Sartre put it many years ago in Anti-Semite and Jew? Quote, What the anti-Semite wishes, what he prepares for, is the death of the Jew. End quote. Thanks for listening.